So we've kind of established one thing, which is that you still believe in value investing. Why? Well, our definition of value investing is figure out what a business is worth and pay a lot less. It has nothing to do with low price book, low price sales. That's what stocks are, ownership shares of businesses. They're not pieces of paper that bounce around that you put fancy sharp ratios or Sortino ratios or whatever. They're actually ownership shares of businesses. So our definition of value investing is value the business and try to buy it at a discount. So by definition, that should never uh, go out of uh, it should eventually go work. out of fashion. It should. Yes, it, it can go out of fashion, but eventually it, it should has. work. Yes. Now, value investing, of course, in principle, is active management. Correct. Do you believe that there's a role for passive products? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, I uh, was asked to give a speech at Google uh, last year, and I started it this way. I said, you know, even Warren Buffett says that uh, most people are better off just indexing. And I said, I agree with him. Uh, I didn't stop my lecture there. I said, you know, <laughs> but then again, Warren Buffett doesn't index, and neither do I. How come? And it's because the opportunity is there if you know how to value businesses, which most people do not. Uh, to take advantage of the fact that the market is emotional over the short term often. You have had some success, Joel, with a hybrid of passive and active management. You call it the Gotham Plus Index Fund. People refer to it by its acronym GINDEX, a ticker, if you will. Explain how it works. Sure. So it's, it's Gotham Index Plus, and it's precisely that. Uh, the problem oh, with most active... Me. Yeah, the... the the problem with most active management is to beat the market, you have to do something different than the market. That means you By return, definition. Yes. So your returns are going to zig and zag differently. Most people don't know the underlying thesis behind each individual pick. Uh, what they see are returns, and that's what they follow. So when uh, funds do well, people pile into them. When funds do badly, they pile out. So even if you're a good active manager and have a good long-term record, uh, uh, many people don't stay with you. I, I wrote a book called The Big Secret in 2011, and I always say it's still a big secret because no one bought that book. But in it was uh, a bunch of studies. One talked about the best performing mutual fund uh, for the decade I wrote in 2011, for 2000 to 2010. That fund was up 18% a year. The average investor in that fund uh, averaged a dollar weighted return of minus 11% per year. They took that 18% annual, and the market was flat. So winning by 18% a year, they lost by 11%. And the reason for that was really that every time the fund did well, people piled in. When it didn't do well, they piled out. Whether it was when the market was up, they piled in. When the market was down, they piled out. And that's what people do uh, because that's all they know. They, can, they look in the rearview mirror and chase return. So how does Gotham Index Plus, if you will, get around that problem? All right, so that, that's the big question. And it, it took some thinking. And what, one thing we did was compromise. Uh, so we said, we're going to start with the index. because. By the way, that's an unusual term to be uttered by a money manager, compromise. Well, if our goal is to help people get to the end goal, meaning saving money, uh, the reason why Warren Buffett suggests people index is because they won't underperform or outperform, and it'll remove one other uh, impediment to you know, sticking with the investment. So we looked at that and said, look, we don't want to make the pain so bad that people leave. We want people to stay and capture our active premium. So we made some compromises. If you give us a dollar, we'll go out and recreate the S&P 500 bottoms up. That's how we start the portfolio. So you get the S&P return. But then we add our active stock picking. We go out and buy 90 cents more of our favorite S&P stocks, and we short 90 cents of our least favorite S&P stocks. So we have a 90 by 90 long short overlay, buying our favorites shorting our least favorites. All we have to do is our favorites have to beat our least favorites, and we'll be able to add to the return of the index. But we make some compromises. We keep the beta at zero. We, we balance the two portfolios so they don't get too out of whack. You're 190% long for the most part, 90% short for the most part. You use a lot of leverage, 280% gross exposure. Yes, the good cynic deal for a mutual fund, yeah. Right, but the cynic might look at it and say you've outperformed. So over the past three years, you've outperformed the S&P 500 by seven percentage points. Now, the S&P 500 is up quite a lot, right, in the past three years and certainly up a lot more in the past ten years. Anybody would be happy beating the market. But again, the cynic would say if you'd taken that leverage and just put it on the S&P 500, you'd be up a whole lot more. So what's, what's the counter to that? 
Oh, sure. Well, uh, we kept the same beta as the S&P, meaning the 90 by 90 long short overlay has zero exposure to the market. So we're adding return without taking additional exposure to the market, which if it had gone down would have hurt you a lot. So that's one major difference. Uh, the other is that this has been probably the worst environment I can think of for a long short manager because the market's gone straight up without correction other than the last few months which was very minor uh, so if you go straight up and we're short what we call hope stocks things trading at stocks trading at 50 or 100 times earnings uh, in a very hopeful environment people get hopeful and they like those hope stocks and so for our longs you know our out of favor stocks that are still gushing cash huge returns on capital to keep up and actually beat those hope stocks Stocks, that was a great performance for us, in my opinion. Joel, we're talking about the S&P 500, large cap U.S. equities. If you look at the universe of U.S. equities, how fairly are they valued? Right. Well, so we actually bottoms up value all the stocks in the S&P 500 uh, and weight them in the weights of the S&P 500. We can do that for the last 28 years. We have good data for that. And so we can contextualize where do we stand today. So where we stand today is in about the 15th percentile towards expensive, meaning the market's been cheaper 85 percent of the time during those 28 years, uh, more expensive 15 percent of the time. Then we can go back and say, not a prediction, but just saying what's happened over mm -hmm. the next year or two from these prices, this valuation level in the past. And what we've seen is the market up 3 to 5 percent over the next year, 8 to 10 over 2. That's subnormal, meaning the market's expensive. The market averaged about 10 percent returns during that whole period, but not negative. So that, that's nice to see. The all caps are a lot different story meaning they are much well, the, more expensive. Yes, the Russell 2000s in the second percentile have been cheaper 98% of the time over the 28 years. Expected returns negative 3 to negative 5% over the next year. Uh, so you really have to look at uh, the individual stocks you're looking at. They're expensive, but there's still opportunities. Joel, I want to thank you for spending time with us here. Oh, my pleasure. Good seeing you. Funny insights from one of the world's great value investors, Joel Greenblatt of Gotham Asset Management.